I believe this is our fourth semester um, working on FLAM. Uh, the members this semester were uh, Philip Capita, Casey Adams, Samantha Spercacci, Mark Shaster, Andrew Soki, and myself. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, FLAM is basically a project for the library um, that was initially intended to serve as a way for students to see if study rooms were open before actually going to the library. Um, but it kind of developed into more uh, and the library got interested in kind of us keeping track of statistics um, and providing some insights on how they can further improve the library. Um, so it kind of serves two purposes on that end for the students and for the library. Uh, the actual project itself consists of a hardware portion and the web application. So the hardware portion are going to be infrared sensors hooked up to Arduinos that are going to be in each study room. Um, these are actually what's going to read if someone's in the room or not. And then the web application is going to receive messages from those um, hardware components and then going to display uh, kind of a, a live map of which rooms are open or not, and then also um, provide statistics and graphs for the library. I'm going to pass it on to Casey now. So our uh, project organization, um, FLAM V2 was forked from the original FLAM repository. Uh, FLAM V2 was set up as a blessed repository. Um, so every new feature, uh, every uh, pretty much every contributor had their own branch this semester. Um, and then those get merged. Um, our tech stack uh, was the web app was a Django Python framework. Uh, front end was HTML CSS, and we we're looking to uh, integrate React for our graphs. Um, our database was Postgres, and then um, all the hardware stuff was our du Arduino C plus um, plus. We used our Discord pretty heavily, um, and we worked hard this semester to really document um, as. Benji's out of here. Um, a couple of the uh, project members are all seniors. Um, looking like Andrew and I are taking over the project uh, come next year, but we really needed to document as much as we could uh, for new members. Uh, all right, let's go to the next to slide. Fill up. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of the progress we made this semester, it was a pretty productive semester. Um, Mark and I were um, on the hardware team and we were actually able to get our first prototypes of the hardware um, created uh, using a, a Node MCU uh, microcontroller, but we actually used the um, Arduino firmware on the Node MCU uh, hardware, which was uh, pretty cool. And we actually have gone ahead and pitched um, the cost and kind of the installation of hardware to the library team. We did that just this past week, which is really exciting. Um, and then the uh, both front end and back end teams have worked on the rudimentary display of correct statistics on the website. So we have graphs so that the library team actually knows, you know, how many people are going into um, the study rooms on a given day and stuff like that. Our, our actual server is live, but not necessarily public yet. Um, for uh, on the RPI servers and then the back end team were working a lot on the unit tests and bug fixes uh, for the storage of statistics. Um, that was a pretty large undertaking just to make sure all that stuff was uh, working well. Hello, um, so as um, Benji kind of mentioned about the um, web app, so you the way it works, this is basically just like the results of a demo because the save time. So the way it works is a student would just walk into the room and they wouldn't have to do anything. Uh, and the sensors would detect them. And what you see on the left is uh, like a floor map, or an example of um, the app or the web app and what it would look like, like red being like a occupied room. And on the right is like an example of um, the statistics that like the library staff could view to help them, you know, with their planning and coordinating. Um, and yeah, so the, as um, Philip mentioned that we have a working hardware prototype. Um, so this demo, you know, it, <laughs> um, it just to save time, this is just the result. Next slide. Yeah, so on the left, we have some of the goals that we set at the start of the semester and ended up achieving. 
Uh, some of those include functional hardware prototypes, uh, proper storage of statistics. We have a graph set up to display those statistics, as you saw in the last slide. Um, we had a successful pitch and implementation plan for the library, so we met with one of the uh, the <coughs> library faculty and ended up pitching the uh, pitching FLOM to them. Uh, they liked it, and for next semester, we're looking to set up um, a couple demo rooms to try and test how the web app performs in those rooms. Um, we're also looking to finish up the statistics portion of the web app. Uh, we're looking to make the web app pu public on RPI servers, and then we're looking at possible COVID-related features depending on what the library needs. Next slide. So I'm Samantha, and uh, I basically worked on some front end uh, uh, fixes in terms of uh, making it more aesthetically pleasing. So originally, um, our about page had the list of developers, and when you hovered over it, it would cut off and you wouldn't be able to see any of the developers. So I created a new page, which just added the box and then links to everybody's GitHub and what semester they worked on it. And then I fixed the login tab. As you can see, there was originally no CSS. And after a few hours of debugging, trying to figure out why uh, colors weren't changing and everything, I settled on this design that was based off the logout page. And now everything looks more aesthetically pleasing as opposed to just plain blue hyperlink. All right. Yeah. So as I said earlier, um, oh, I'm Philip and also I am worked on hardware with Mark. Um, and in particular, we first kind of figured out what the specifications and design for our current hardware prototype would be because we didn't have a fully fleshed out a prototype when we started this semester. So we actually went through, looked online, figured out, you know, what microcontroller we need, what sensors we need, uh, what wires we need, and all that kind of stuff to figure out, you know, what would what would be the best um, and also most cost effective um, for the project. Um, this also because we pretty much redesigned the hardware from the ground up. We ended up overhauling the previous uh, hardware code base because the other uh, code base essentially required us to link up each of the microcontrollers to one another kind of in this uh, hive map uh, type deal. Um, whereas with our new uh, version, each of the individual microcontrollers has a Wi-Fi chip on it and will connect directly to um, our main server for RPI. Um, so we had to pretty much overhaul that stuff. I did a lot of work on uh, creating documentation for the hardware, so a general readme uh, of just what the hardware parts are, um, how to kind of get started with things, specifically a motion sensor setup guide. So if someone were to order the same parts, they'd be able to set it up and get things working. Um, I also did a... a, a a kind of a temporary uh, over the air solution for updating the microcontrollers. So basically, you're able to connect to each individual uh, microcontroller um, using its IP address and then upload a new uh, firmware sketch to the microcontroller. We like to have it be where you can just put in a command line, you know, whatever the firmware is and have it update all of them. But for now, this prevents us from having to, you know, go into every single room and actually plug it in serially into a into a computer so we can still do it um, online. And then did a little bit of troubleshooting and debugging of issues um, with connecting uh, the microcontrollers to FLOM. Uh, Mark was the one that actually got the fix uh, for that, which was great. And then I also just helped with a, a couple of bug fixes. There were some issues with um, some of the libraries we were using in a new version of Django that were deprecated and then removed. Um, and so I was able to fix the, the libraries and the function calls um, so that it worked with the new uh, Django version. So yeah. Yeah, I'm Andrew. Uh, I worked a lot on debugging the statistics portion of the web app, uh, specifically how we were calculating certain statistics that we have, such as uh, like the total number of occupants in a room or the average time somebody or the average time a room was occupied. Uh, one of the things I did at the start of the semester was updating some of the things in those methods to work with newer versions of Django. Um, I also worked to make the way, or basically made how we calculated the average occupancy time more efficient. 
Um, I, I removed unnecessary calculations that we had, uh, and I also worked to fix errors that we had with multiple people entering and leaving rooms. Uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Andrew and I shared a branch. Um, we did a lot of unit testing. Uh, he did. He worked on those functions that calculate things, um, such as like uh, average occupancy length, which you see on the right here. Um, this is what you see in the Django admin um, of the database. Um, we were actually able to simulate time with a, a module called Python freeze gun. Um, so you could step forward in time um, and test that our thread is actually creating um, our database models, how we want them to. Hi, I'm Mark. Um, I worked on firmware and hardware for this. Um, the little picture is just like a little, um, model I put together. You know, I like cut up a pencil box and, um, that's what I use for testing on myself. Um, and so I worked on the logic that goes on the microcontroller and how it uh, communicates the flum. Next slide. Uh, Benji again. So I was the project manager this semester. Um, so I was kind of in charge of tasking, make sure, making sure everyone had something to do um, and they were enjoying it. So I was assisting kind of diff every kind of component or feature um, of the project throughout the semester. Um, I've been in contact with Andrew, who's the president of the library, because I really did want to get this um, ball rolling with implementation because it is most of our last semesters. Um, so I kind of wanted to finish most of the features and get them in a spot where a new new members could easily pick it up um, and get it rolling into the library. Uh, along with that, I was working on um, the React front end, so I kind of led React this semester um, and have been working on how to implement that with Django. Uh, I believe that's it. Just overall, um, I'm happy with how Flom did this semester, um, especially since all the members were new. If not, I think Sam may have worked on it for a semester. But I'm really hoping that either this summer due to COVID, um, I'm not sure, but um, we do want to get this implemented and we have funding from the library. So I'm really excited about the future of Flom. I do not have a question slide, but this is where we take questions. <laughs> Cool. Why don't we, uh, there we go. Perfect. Let's get somebody else started up. And while they are, um, any questions for Benji or the Flom crew? Uh, yeah, we have a, a question from Eli. How much would it cost to fit out the library with all of your sensors? Yeah. So we had made a rough kind of Excel spreadsheet. I think before in a previous semester, we had pitched like $8,000, but we got it down to around five fifty for the entire library. I'm pretty sure. $550. Nice. How many rooms is that? Uh, 63, I believe. That's a good, uh, that's a good, um, hardware design because if I try to do, you know, even motion sensors, uh, using one of the commercial packages, I think it's 20 bucks a sensor. So mm -hmm. Mark and Mark and Philip did a great job of researching different kind of parts. Um, an 8,500 is a pretty big, uh, big step. So yeah, we we're proud of that. Very nice. Um, any plans for a feature to prevent people from sleeping in study rooms, to which Hunter replies, a uh, loud siren, perhaps? Uh, no, we support that. Yeah, good, good. That's the RPI way. <laughs> All right. Um, we have, uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Nice job. Well done. Uh, I think now we have dorm design. I would like to give you guys more time for questions. And if we have time after at the end of this, we can certainly do that. Um, but there's so many projects this year. Take it away, Graham. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Graham. This is Dorm Design. I'm just going to get right into it. Hopefully, everyone can hear me and can see my screen because I yep. can't really tell. Yeah, you're, right. you're good. All right. So what is Dorm Design? So during these trying times, we can't really see people. That, that's been a thing. So we developed a platform. It's a collaborative platform for designing and planning dorm rooms. It includes a packing list and a room editor. And you can assign, claim items, add quantities, dimensions, and any item in the packing list can be viewed in the editor. Let's say you have like a couch. You're going to want to see where that is in relation to the rest of the room. But if you have something like, I don't know, like a water bottle, you don't really care. You don't want to see where it is in the room. 
you just want to have. You want to say, okay, I'm bringing this water bottle. I really need this water bottle, but it doesn't have a place. And you can also design a room from scratch or use a pre-existing design. So you can change all aspects of the room, the dimensions, the default furniture, layout, and other users can clone your room and then use it as a template. And originally in the last version, so last semester, you would just send over your ID code, they could clone it. But that let it lend itself to people modifying the room, which is a no-no. So we addressed this later on, as we'll see. And it's designed to be anonymous. So no account is required. We actually don't support accounts at all. It stores all information that you need in the browser. So nickname, recently viewed, rooms, all stored in the browser. Nothing touches the database. And we don't store any personal information at all. Now, what do we accomplish this semester? First of all, deployment. And you can actually go to right there. Hopefully it doesn't, doesn't break. So we also set up HTTPS to easily work with the production Docker configuration, also an extra layer of security. And also we have recently viewed rooms. They're stored in the browser. Templates are stored independently of the room's data. We also made some room boundary interface improvements and we ported the Go-based backend to Node. And that may be a questionable decision. I'll explain it a little later on. So this is what it looked like before. This was last semester's work for the homepage, at least. And after some additions, which we'll touch on later, this is what it looks like now. It's a little bit more muted. The buttons, it's a lot more minimal. And you can see at the bottom, recent rooms, and then Graham's cool room. So, and then you can click on that and go to your room. And this is what it looks like. This is what the interface looks like. The editor on the right, you can see the room list. You can add items. And there's other settings and whatnot you can explore to get the little the uh, other stuff but anyways all right i guess i'll pick it up from there um read and i'll i'll be start i'll start by talking about the uh the stack we're using so uh, on the front end we're using react bootstrap um, sas for the for the styling and then html canvas for the the editor um on the back end we we used to be using go as as just mentioned, um, but we switched to using Node.js and Express. And I guess we'll talk about that a bit more later on. Um, for the database, we're using Rethink, Rethink DB, which is kind of a, a real-time uh, optimized database since um, all of the stuff uh, is done in real time. Um, and then for for the production and development environments, we're using we're using Docker, and we have an MIT license. So for the project organization this semester, we used uh, GitHub projects and the, the issue tracker. So we kind of set up this little, like, I guess, development pipeline in GitHub projects, which just uh, helped us to kind of visualize what step each feature was at in the, like, in the pipeline. Um, and even though there's only, I mean, there's only two of us working on the project, it really helped uh, to keep things kind of more organized. Yeah, so uh, so one of the things I worked on this semester was the the landing page improvements. So I, as you saw in the the screenshots before, I kind of cleaned up the the styling a bit more, made it more more uh, minimal, and then uh, I I implemented a little visualization for the the recent room section, um, with this little little room thumbnail um, that shows recent rooms that a user has visited. Uh, in the future, we're kind of hoping to to put like a little, I guess, like a thumbnail, like a PNG or something of of the actual room layout that you could kind of preview instead of just like a white little little box. But um, and then yeah, it kind of helps because you know we don't really want to have like actual like a login and registration system. We just kind of want the the room links themselves to be the way that uh, users access each of the different rooms. So um, this kind of helps, you know, instead of having to write down each of the, the room IDs, you can just kind of see what rooms you recently visited. And then the, the other thing that I worked on was the layout editor. So this kind of before the previous system that we had in place was just like a list of XYZ coordinates or just XY, not XYZ, but um, you just kind of had to manually edit that list, um, which which made it pretty difficult to visualize the the room boundary itself. 
Um, so I, I implemented this little like editor that you can, you know, drag around the different points uh, for the room boundary. And, you know, you can either just drag them around on the screen or use the little text box in the, the upper left to get more like fine tuned uh, positioning of the points. Yeah. All right, so I, it's, it's hard to predict. I'm not sure. Anyway, so <laughs> so we ported Node.js well, to Node.js from Go. And I really like Go. I, I like C to begin with, and Go is like the spiritual successor in a way. But it has its flaws, at least as far as I'm concerned for the project. So first of all, there's static typing, which lends itself to really messy database queries. And since most, a lot of the data, a lot of the backend rather, is messing around with the database, I thought that was a little bit of an issue because it was really hard to maintain it. And there's not many libraries for our use case, at least, in case we want to expand. Because something that I was looking into was having server-side rendering for both, uh, for both SEO as well as performance because server-side rendering is just better performance for the front end, at least. And something we, something, a library that we could use is Next.js, which, which is, of course, a Node.js library. But so let's say we wanted to achieve that with Go. I was looking into it. There are some really hacky solutions where it's like you embed a JavaScript runtime into Go and then the JavaScript does it. And I thought that was that that's just a pain that I don't want to deal with. So porting to Node or JavaScript rather made sense in that regard if we want to expand the project. And it's also a relatively small language compared to Node.js or rather JavaScript itself, but the runtime. So whenever somebody picks up this project in the future, we want to ensure that the barrier of entry is not too high. If we use something like Go and then they look into it, it's like a really messy code base that's going to push people away from joining the project and actually putting what they want into the project. And since people are really familiar, at least in our coast, at least, they're familiar with JavaScript, that will draw people in and people can actually contribute meaningful things to the project, which is ultimately what we wanted. So, and of course, we want we. We're okay with sacrificing a little bit of performance game for maintainability for the future of the project. We also worked on room templates. So we added template identifiers, which are generated when you create a room. And it allows users to clone rooms without giving them right access. Because as I said before, if you had just the room ID, you could go in and make changes, which would be very bad. But with the template ID, you can go in, clone using the template ID, and then all of that data will be just be copied over to that room and you can't edit it because it's it's read only. So these are the retrospective plans from last semester. So first of all, to have the recently viewed rooms, we got that. I keep pushing the 3D room render because I think it'll be really cool, but I don't know how practical it really is. That's I feel like it's gonna be on the back burner for a while. And then we also added the ability to mark rooms as templates so they can't be edited, and we could not do the RPI room plans, but that's going to come on. That's going to come back on the next slide. So future plans. I'm still going to plug that 3D room render because I think it's cool. Server side rendering with Next.js. Again, the SEO and performance improvements. Implement some sort of marketplace where people can post their templates for other people to use. And that kind of ties in with the next point, which is converting the RPI floor plans because we're looking into having some sort of crowdsourced marketplace or so people can post like the Bray Hall room template and then people can just clone it like that. So as opposed to having the room templates built into the platform, having some sort of marketplace where people can interface with the platform and become part of the platform as opposed to us supporting everything. Does anybody have any questions? I guess if you do, you can ask or text in the chat. But... All right, um, so I think uh, RPI campus map is next. So let's get them started up. Um, and then, then please go ahead with your question. Okay, so the the one question that I'm seeing in the uh, in the chat is, um, why rethink database over other alternatives? So something this was I spent quite a bit of time looking into databases, and one of them is like Redis or Redis, however you want to pronounce it. That was one. Rethink came up, and what's it called the one that google bought firebase that i think that's what it's called so first of all i wanted it to be open source so firebase was out of the question and so then it was between like like redis redis or implementing our own real-time solution with another database 
or using Rethink. And Rethink was designed for real-time databases, so that's why we went with it, because we just wanted to hit the ground running, just just develop as fast as we can. So that's why we ultimately, ultimately went with it. So, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I have a suggestion from Frank that you should have ju just chosen Rust instead of Go. So... Uh, Looking and, back on it, we should have done it, but yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, and, and we also have um, uh, Hunter makes the comment that Mongo has licensing issues now too. Well, that's a, uh, within the last couple of years they changed their license. All right, um, so good job, um, thank you. Let's. Uh, if you have any more questions, please continue to to to, to knock questions into. Uh, into the uh, the chat room, um, and and uh, hopefully they will monitor it and answer you. Um, but we will go with Campus Map and Justin and company. Um, whenever you're ready, guys. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Manushri, uh, and my teammates are Justin, Priya, Carl, and Eric, and we are Campus Map. Next slide. <laughs> um, so. RPI Campus Map is an interactive map um, designed for students, mainly freshmen, to find anything on campus that they may need. Um, each of these yellow dots are specific locations we have identified, and they each have um, descriptions and pictures to really uh, get into details on every spot on campus. Um, we also have a search bar um, for these buildings, so you can search them by names, nicknames, or the descriptions so students can really find whatever they need. So our goals for the semester were to include um, building out some of our web pages, so some information about um, specific buildings and improving our search page, as well as API development and documentation. So continue building that out as well, and some bug fixes to um, enhance usability and fix small quirks to really polish up the app overall and make sure all of our packages were up to date and nothing was breaking because of out-of-date packages. Um, and ongoing goals, um, you know, of course, is testing, making sure everything is working the way that we want it to, trying to break things, um, and as well as growing the team and preparing for handoff in the future. So in terms of our application structure, it's very simple. Um, like a lot of projects are using, we're hosting our project on Heroku. We've done our front end in React, and our back end is in Node.js and Express, and we're using a MongoDB database. Um, the database interacts with the back end, back end back to the front end, and then it can be viewed in your browser. So you can use it either on mobile or on desktop. Then in terms of our development structure, we're using GitHub to organize everything. Um, we use the issue tab there to keep track of what things we're going to be working on and the project tracker so that everybody has their own individual um, issues assigned to them. Um, and then in terms of our code base, we have our front end and back end completely separated with their own configuration files. So um, any like node modules and things can be installed to either only the front end or only the back end. And you could also mix and match if you wanted to create your own front end, let's say, but use the campus map API, you could do that as well. Um, like I said, we have a dedicated API that has um, dedicated routes for things like the locations and the users separately. And our project is listed under the MIT license. So for our individual contributions, um, first up is me. Um, I've mainly been doing bug fixes this semester. Um, and the first picture that you can see on the slide here is actually what the project looked like for the first time when we tried to run it this semester. This was um, during um, like uh, project meet and greets basically. So like <laughs> imagine my surprise running the project and everything is completely blank. And it turned out that um, Mapbox had actually changed their, the way that you do API calls. And it happened like around March of last year, apparently, but it hadn't been an issue for us until this year. So we had to go in and make sure that we changed that and updated that before we could actually get started this semester. Um, and then also I worked on some components that were unnecessarily re-rendering, um, some API keys that were just scattered throughout the code base that should have been hidden 
so that you know now they are and i also had to continually change the um, configuration files and the ci files so that the projects would build correctly um, for a couple of different things that we did this semester um, that both interacted with the front end and the back end so it was a really strong um, learning experience for me this semester and while i was doing that i was also helping out my team members because i like to have campus map be a place where people who don't necessarily have that much um, experience with web dev can feel comfortable and actually contribute so it was um, really nice to be able to help out everybody too all right i guess i'm up next my name is priya um, so some of the stuff that i've been working on this semester started off really restructuring our API because it was kind of messy and not super intuitive with the number of like different components that we had. Um, so restructuring it so it made a little bit more sense and was um, more usable. Um, I also continued to work with CAST this semester, which was um, an ongoing thing from the end of last semester, uh, really to be able to implement CAST logout because we had basically in implemented um, being able to log in with CAST last semester. So um, I was working a lot with Justin on getting this up and running. There were some issues with getting a logout button to first show once you had logged in. So I had to do some research on what tools that were out there that we could use, such as like contacts versus Redux. These were both um, things that I wasn't totally familiar with. So just knowing what the difference was and what would be useful for us. Um, it was definitely a learning experience. <laughs> And then the next task was really ensuring that when we did log out from CAST, we were able to get back to Campus Map instead of just ending up on the CAST logout screen. And the solution to that was actually, after a lot of searching on the internet, was um, our thought was maybe we should go look at the source code for this CAST package and lo and behold, overwriting um, some of the functionality there helped solve our problem. So throughout this process, just keeping up with documentation, so maybe that this this could be helpful for other Arcos projects um, now because we know that it's been a, a tricky subject for some projects. And I also helped out some of my teammates with the location descriptions as we're trying to collect some more information to display on our page, um, which has been a long and arduous process as well. Uh, hi, I'm Carl. My main kind of thing to one of my main things that I was doing this semester was implementing the search bar because on our map, like the search bar existed, but it didn't actually like do anything. So getting that implemented and up and running was part of my main goal this semester. And then also, as mentioned before, a big part of what we were doing this semester is updating the location descriptions. And you can kind of see that in this screenshot below where the description for Walker is just biochem lab building, which isn't super exciting. So we got all of those uh, updated and then also the next step to that is if you look closely, you can tell that that is in fact not Walker, that's the DCC. So we're gonna be getting real pictures of the places and then getting all that up and running. And then just overall, just kind of preparing for the future as all of the seniors in our group are going to be graduating, um, just like preparing to continue on the project and starting to take more of a, a bigger role in it overall. Hi, I'm back. Um, so the first thing I did was learn web development for the first time. Um, I am a senior, but I'm a CSC, so we don't have much experience in that realm. Um, but I was grateful to all my team members to help me through that and really figure out this crazy project structure um, that I was very unfamiliar with. So after learning that, I went in to try my first issue. Um, so what that was, was I tried to remove the latitude and longitude markers from production. Um, so if you see in that picture, uh, anywhere you click on the map, this like you click the map that blah, blah, blah comes up. Um, but I removed that from production and kept that in dev so that if we needed the location, we could use it. But obviously, we don't need students to see that or users to see that whenever they click on the map. After doing that, I created a test file <laughs> um, using Jest. The issue with that was um, I needed a static HTML and like the node environment was a test environment instead of like production or dev. So I really couldn't create a unit test, but I committed what I had and hopefully this can be a future issue I work with. Um, 
And then next, uh, I worked on the campus map descriptions with all my team members. Um, there are a lot of locations on our map with very minimal descriptions and not the right pictures. So we all kind of like paused our own uh, commits and got together and worked on these descriptions. And then finally, and most importantly, I was the comedic relief of the team. Of course, you need that. <laughs> So being my first semester at Arcos, I had to learn how um, GitHub and how the whole stack and VS Code and all that stuff, which took a lot longer than I'd like to admit. But the team was really helpful with uh, helping me learn on all that stuff. So when I got that uh, squared away, I worked with Carl to get the search bar implementation to work. That taught me a lot, and I kind of learned how JavaScript and React is really versatile, and there are tons of libraries you can use for like tons and tons of different uh like niche like sorry tons of niche uh circumstances you can use different libraries for and then also uh i worked on the campus uh locations and descriptions but i also added some new ones as well because uh we are still missing some areas in the campus map so i'm working on that and then as always uh we're going to be running into some problems, uh, but uh, just a quick run through of what we faced. First, there are a lot of configuration changes in Heroku and GitHub, and it made the project start to kind of build kind of wonky, so we had to fix those. And then also the API was changing behind the scenes, which let, was one of the reasons why the, the campus map was not rendering correctly, as Justin mentioned earlier. And then finally, as always, CAS kind of continues to be pesky. But as we improve our documentation, hopefully as new developers come on, we'll be able to address that a little bit more easily. And then finally, as always, uh, there's so much to do, not enough time, but we take that in stride. Friendly for our future plans, um, I do want to continue Campus Map with Arcos, even though I'll be graduating. So it's very important that we expand our documentation and continue to grow the team in the coming semesters. And one other thing that Professor Kuzman brought up last semester was to potentially create a template for other campuses to use and create their own versions of Campus Map. So I thought that that was something that would be really cool. Um, you know, it goes with the whole spirit of open source to so just like to provide a more paired back version of campus map that's just straight up campus map and not rpi campus map so that could be something i could do in my free time so just some special thanks to professor turner and all the arcos coordinators and mentors and yeah thanks a lot guys it's been really fun awesome we appreciate you uh being around justin um so while while you're uh Taking any questions, let's get Alira, uh, AI Toolkit up. Is this live right now? I guess that's my my major question. I'm looking through. I'm not seeing any any. I've seen a lot of discussion, but not a lot of questions. You know, my question would be, you know, if if I wanted to, I have a son who's. Uh, I'll bring him on campus, but he's looking at colleges right now. Um, if I wanted to point him at this, is it is it functional enough that we could actually do a, a virtual tour, or or not just yet? Yeah, so um, there is a live version up. Um, like we showed before, the main things that we have to do before we could like consider it like, you know, like really that helpful would be to add the rest of the um, photos for the locations and fix the descriptions. So the descriptions are already in progress, and the photos are getting a lot better now that it's you know nice weather out and it's not you know dark outside at four p.m. So. <laughs> That's what we're working on right now. Cool. Yep. Is uh is Alira here? I'm not seeing. It's an IBM project. Yeah, I'm just trying to get my slides up. All right, I'm seeing you now, Jenna. Right now, we're just seeing. It looks like field hockey. I think. All right, here we go. 
I don't know if Gracie is here or not. Um, um I'm right here. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Great. Let me just um, get back to this. So, hello. We are Elira. My name is Jennifer. I'm one of the developers on um, Elira. I've been with Arc. This is my third semester on Arc Coast and my first semester working with Elira. Um, I'm Russia. This is my second semester with Arcos, and this is my first semester with Elira. So what is Elira? Elira is an IBM project. It is basically a set of AI centric extensions for Jupyter Lab. So it has things like pipeline editors. Um, and then it also has pipe Python editors. There's other stuff with metadata. But yeah, as you can see here, that's what the launch screen looks like for Elira. Um, some of Elira's other features include uh, users can create and run their own AI pipelines. They can run notebooks as batch jobs. They can reuse code snippets. Um, they're able to navigate notebooks using auto generated an auto generated table of contents, and uh, it also includes version control using Git integration. So the way we organize this project is that this is obviously a project that was collaboration with IBM. So it had a lot of um, senior developers um, on top of us too as the Arcos developers. So already Elira has a get started um, document. As you can see, there's a link to um, getting started as a developer. But within Arcos, we um, have the way we assigned our issues was that we had an issue tracker and they were labeled specifically for Arcos students. And there were issues that we could pick that were labeled more for Arcos students to have. Um, since this was a really large scale project, uh, our uh, specific contributions were relatively small. So what I worked on was the fact is, is that this project was not very Windows friendly or Windows developer friendly. So I worked on developing, basically debugging the developing environment for Windows and finding all the issues and coming up with fixes so other Windows developers could start working on the project. And I also worked on fixing issues with KFP pipeline, with the Cubaflow pipelines not working yeah. properly on Windows, essentially with the metadata not sharing pro that essentially having it fail with metadata that worked properly on a Mac. So uh, similar to Jen, I also ran into uh, Windows development issues really early on in the process. So before I could start making like actual contributions, I had to find a solution to my development environment. So I decided that I would use Docker container images as a development environment for Elira to run changes from your own forked repo. And um, in addition, I worked on some small UI features, which included adding notifications for users if code snippets were saved or deleted in the notebooks. So some of our future plans was um, obviously right now, I'm still working on more in those issues have um, as they arise, hopefully getting it to a place where Windows developers can come and not um, hopefully getting the page to a point where um, Windows developers um, can uh, just develop on the project without any issues. And then there was another suggestion brought up about possibly shifting over to NPM because of some of the Windows issues like over make. But again, that might be a thing that I'm might be working on suggesting and see it we'll see how far I can get with the Windows issues. And that was our project. All right. Any questions for uh Lyria? Let's see. We have Hunter saying uh based on limited experience of compiling a few programs on Windows, Windows development one ten, not recommended, it's not fun. Frank asks, how was working on a large scale IBM project? So either one of those, one's a kind of a comment, but if you want to follow mm -hmm. up on it and then, and then there's a question. So I would say I actually enjoyed working on IBM, like large scale IBM project. It was honestly different because the past two projects I had worked on in our coast were very um, built from scratch and were obviously like, I was working on more features themselves because they haven't been, they weren't products that were fully run. So it was definitely different especially because this is the first time where I was really working with like major senior developers too and having them 
on a very and working on a very large scale project so i would recommend honestly doing it again i i enjoyed it and i would honestly go back if this opportunity arises again cool um and and uh you, you can read the the comment but let's uh let's get um whoever i said quacks get getting started up on on this this st stage and while they're doing that Frank comments that he's always nervous to contribute to other projects that people use. So it's really cool to see a project like this and uh, a little bit of jealousy there. I'm going to say that that I kind of like the, the way you guys, uh, it's not really a question either, but you, you both picked different pivots and I think they're both very useful. Um, pivoting to Docker was a really good um, thought to, to kind of allow you to continue to contribute uh, even when there were problems on your, on your machine. So that's a really good workaround or a really good way to get you know, to, 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 to get a non-native environment uh, for your machine up and working. But I also like the fact that that, that you guys uh, took some time to try to get, you know, to try to uh, increase the number of people who can contribute to, uh, to this project by trying to increase the number of platforms it would work on. Um, so both of those, I, I liked, I kind of liked the fact that despite you, ha you having problems, you had those workarounds. Um, so... You know, anyway, I just thought I would throw that out there. Any comments before we turn this over to uh, to our quackers? Apparently not. All right. Good job, guys. Um, uh, John, Eli, and Ben. Are you? Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, so we are Quacks, as you just said. Uh, the team consists of John, Eli, which is me, and Ben. Um, so just a little description about what Quacks is. Quacks is a course scheduling program, um, which means it helps you pick courses that you want to take at RPI and discover new courses. Um, we've got a lot of features, including automatic schedule generation, um, conflict checking, so you can make sure that you're not taking conflicting courses, um, automatic prerequisite checking, so that you can make sure you can only you're taking courses you're allowed to. Um, our data is always up to date within the last hour, and you can view past semesters all the way back to 2007. Um, at Quacks, new this semester, we're fully funded with ads, so all of our costs are fully paid for. Um, so it's actually slightly profitable. Um, a brief history of Quacks. So Quacks was initially started as an April Fool's joke. Um, for the RPI academic server, and it was going to be a Discord bot for course scheduling. Um, but then in March 2020, I was looking to register for Arch courses, and I was struggling to, uh, so Yax had not updated it, and I was struggling to figure out which courses I want to take and make sure they didn't conflict. So I spent about a week, and I made the old version of Quacks, which very few people probably have seen, um, but it gained some support. People really liked it. So over Arch in my free time, um, along with Ben, we worked on Modern Quacks, which is the current version of Quacks you see today. Um, and then some other milestones. In October, we added previous semester support back to 2007. Um, in January this semester, we officially joined Arcos as an Arcos project. Um, in February, we came full circle and we now have Arch six week support. Um, so you can use Quacks to view six week support. And then today is our presentation. Ben? Um, if Ben isn't here in the, the meantime, I, I can take this one. Um, so just a brief, uh, oh, okay. Ben's here, but his audio, I'll, I'll wait a second. Hello. Hi, we're hearing that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the features of Quacks is that we have uh, uh, our own self-hosted analytics, and we can use this to uh, track views and how people are using the site. So since this, uh, since Quacks, the analytics at least launched back last November, we've had a bit over thirty thousand total visitors, uh, and that's unique sessions. And then uh, we've had 725,000 page views. And then the best day individually would be back in November when people were registering for their spring courses, where we had 2,000 visitors and 40,000 page views. And all this data is publicly available. Uh, it looks like John sent the link 
in chat. Uh, and it's all uh, anonymized and private. Um, so there aren't privacy concerns there. Next. So in terms of uh, our organization, uh, we use the MIT license. Our tech stack is Vue.js, uh, Rust WASM pack. Uh, it, Quacks is a PW, PWA, which is a progressive web app, which means that it can be installed uh, as an application on mobile devices, along with uh, being available offline. Uh, our scraping for collecting data is run uh, with GitHub Actions. And that's all written in Python. And then all of our uh, actual code is stored within the Quacks GitHub organization. We use the blessed repository model. And then there are two major repos. There is the Quacks repo, which is the main repository to store the code. And then there is our Quacks data repo, which is updated automatically every hour through GitHub Actions with data which is being scraped. Uh, in terms of managing uh, features and planning work, we have the issue tracker uh, with various labels such as good first issue, and we also use feature branches for development. Uh, next. So now we're just going to talk a little bit about everyone's going to present their, some of their contributions for the semester. All right, um, so I'm going first. Uh, so my uh, my primary uh, objectives this semester kind of fell under four categories. So I have the first two here. So the first big one was uh, I referred to as core scraping improvements. We were having much more CI failures than I would like with our hourly scraping relating to failing to log into SIS or Sometimes GitHub Actions just couldn't establish a network request or we had some random timeout. So one of the things I did early on was just implement a very simple retry mechanism. It retries up to three times to avoid, you know, uh, locking someone out of, of SIS in the event that something, you know, is actually wrong on our side. And that seems to have done the trick in, in, in getting our, our passing uh, scraping percentage way up. In addition, uh, to keep the, the time down uh, for each scraping, I implemented a, just a, a very simple thing that we don't pull data for semesters that, are, that have ended anymore. So an example right now is in the current uh, group of, of semesters that is checked out. Fall 2020 is skipped, and, and soon spring 2021 will, will be skipped as it concludes. The next major thing was build improvements. Um, so we had a lot of duck crossing signs that were keeping uh, things pretty slow. And so after we relocated those, we discovered um, that uh, we could get our build times down from a scraping, down from around 30 to 35 minutes in the, in the worst case, down to about two, two to four, because now uh, Quacks just can figure out what semesters changed in a given scrape and then only rebuild those. That way we're not doing a lot of uh, wasted work. And so you get your uh, updated information faster. And then the last major build improvement was we didn't have uh, dependency pinning for, for Rust properly set up. So this led to some random failures when one of our transitive dependencies got an update. So that's now fixed. Everything's going through Dependabot for one minor exception, just because it takes a long time to build. So that should hopefully reduce issues in the future, because um, of course, the, by Murphy's Law, this had to manifest during course registration that builds all of a sudden failed. So hopefully that's uh, a thing of the past, at least not as much as it is now. Uh, next slide. And then some registration quality of life uh, improvements. We now have closed section indicators. There's no more getting your hopes up only to find uh, the dreaded section is closed. If a course is out of crossless slots or for whatever reason the professor has it set to closed, Quacks will now let you know. And then some people woke up to a nasty surprise when daylight savings time came, or came around that their calendar exported schedule had shifted. Um, so we taught the course scheduler a class this semester on how iCalendar time zones work. Um, it only got an A minus, so there is a potential for bugs, but it was working in Google Calendar. So, you know, feel free to log an issue, but we don't expect this. If you have been hit by this, just regenerate your schedule again and it should be properly pinned. 
And then the last major thing I did was uh, an improvement on just a uh, development tooling. There is an awesome feature in Git known as Git hooks, which can run on certain actions such as pre-commit or merge um, or just check out. And what this lets you do is it lets you run as a script. So in this case, before uh, commit is generated, we run our linter. And the linter will automatically clean up the source code if it can, and if it can't, it will fail out, and it will prevent the commit from going through. Git will spit out a nasty message just saying, you know, this is what happened, and there is a way to override it in case there is an emergency and something had to get pushed up. But this should hopefully take care of uh, surprises relating to someone pushing something only to find out it's not passing the most basic test. Um, and they're very easy to use. Uh, next slide. And then this is just a small little demonstration of, of the major thing. So we have the closed attributes here on distributed systems. I, I thought a nice little touch in the section info is to link to the override form. This is probably a bigger deal for those who don't uh, have a lot of experience with RPI registration. And then we just have a before and after for scraping. This previous job took you know, over half an hour. Now we're down to like under three minutes. So you know, eventually we're going to be doing the next scraping while um, uh, one hadn't even finished yet. And uh, next slide. And then this is the me signing off. This is just a simple demo of me putting an obvious syntax error. I'm a bad change hiding up in your main dot typescript. And I go ahead and commit it. I tell Eli not to read it because I want to be sneaky. But Git won't let me do that commit as the linting fails. And that's all for me. Um. OK, so some of the stuff I worked on this semester, um, I started off the semester reorganizing our issue tracker and added a ton of labels um, because it was sort of a mess. Um, I also worked on a scraper for the transfer course guide. So if you've ever wanted to transfer anything or transfer course into RPI, you might have seen this website. Um, but the problem with it is it, it, most, it just sorts by um, the school or the location that you're transferring from, but not the course. So let's say you want to transfer in CS1 or something. Um, or you want to transfer in a science class, there's not really a way to find that. Um, so now in the Quacks data repo, um, it's not currently on the front end, but you can look at any course and you can go and you can find it and you can figure out exactly which schools RPI allows transfers for. Um, so it makes it a lot easier. Um, and then I've just done a bunch of refactoring and fixing smaller bugs. Um, something I've been working on recently is adding links to individual courses so that you can actually share a course with a friend or um, we can use it on the website, for instance, if you want to see which course a prerequisite links to, you can click on it. Um. All right, so uh, for me, uh, the first big thing I did was I introduced, or I updated the schedule view so that it will now show ARC subsemesters. You can see a screenshot of that here. Previously, only the uh, calendar bottom part of that screenshot would be visible on Quax and uh, things would be overlapping and you wouldn't be able to switch between subsemesters. Now it all happens automatically and in the future if RPI decides that they want to introduce uh, three sessions for Arch, in theory this will all just update how it renders with no issue. Uh, as Eli mentioned earlier in this presentation, we also added advertisements and sponsors. So these are RPI related advertisements the advertisers reach out to us and we can add their uh, advertisement to the home page. Um, and then additionally, I automated Dependabot PRs so that um, if a dependency gets updated and it does not break our build and it passes all CI checks, it will automatically get merged in. Next. So any questions? All right, let's uh, let's get the next group staged while we while we take any questions. That would be uh, click. So uh, the one question I have, let's see, let's see, there's a lot of a lot of discussion about hooks and things in here. I, I'm I'm kind of interested in how you came up with the Patreon model, um, because it's it's you're the first group that I'm aware of that actually took the fact that you can make money off of open source software to heart and actually started uh, getting contributions while they were developing the project. There are some that have gone out afterward, you know, after Arcos and, and, and done that. But I think you're the first group to do it while still working on the project, which is kind of cool. Um, so 
I was just looking at the costs that we were accruing for our servers and like the domain, which weren't a ton, but it does add up. And I was like, okay, we've, and we had this analytics and we've got thousands of visitors viewing our page. So I just did some quick looking and I realized that we can make some decent money um, if we added ads uh, with like Google ads or something. But instead we wanted to target it more towards the RPI community or something relevant. Um, and Patreon's just a simple way to have people pay you and they can subscribe month by month. Um, so it's just the reason we pay Patreon was specifically just because it's simplicity. Um, Good, good. I, I, I liked I, I liked the fact that you did that. So that was that was that was fun. That could be a model going forward. Um, we are running short on time, so I'm going to hold up other questions. Please type them. Um, please type them uh, into the, the the chat, and we'll get started with Clip while while maybe that's going on. Um, Clip. Hi. I can. You guys hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, I'll be presenting Clip. Uh, so let's meet the dev team. So it's just me, unfortunately. Uh, oh, I guess I should mention my presentation has a, an absolute metric ton of memes. So you can either look at the memes or listen to the presentation. That's really up to you. Uh, but yeah, this is me. I'm working on Clip. Uh, what is Clip? Well, oh, I misspelled that. OK. Well, Clip is a, is a gaming uh, social media platform where you can share clips directly from consoles, from your phone, or uh, on a, on a web page. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you can kind of interact with the creators. Um, but on top of that, we're, we're trying to really improve on that kind of standard that, you know, so we're really trying to gamify this, right? And what does that mean? You know, um, so you'll be gaining currency, like in-game currency, like how you have with most games, right? Most games have a, some sort of in-game currency. By interacting with the app, you can then spend it to improve uh, your quality of life within the app, you know, the colors and, and images and everything, and how other people perceive you within the app. And um, another kind of main feature is that as a creator, as a content creator, there, there's going to be different types of users of the, uh, using the app. As a creator, you can use this as a separate platform um, for uh, gaining revenue, right? So via subscriptions, you can get uh, monthly subscriptions, and you can get ads, and you can get direct donations. Um, so we're kind of hoping to be the, the facil facilitating platform that can kind of merge all this, where right? you could watch clips, post clips, um, and, and usually clips, by clip I mean something between zero and 60 seconds long, right? So not very long videos. Um, what is it currently? It's currently an app. Um, depending on how things go, uh, the web alpha should be released very soon after the, the, the app alpha, but I'll talk about that later. Um, so how's it being built? So during this semester, I finally settled on a tech stack. I've been kind of bouncing between a couple, debating, uh, you know, finding different kind of reasons for each one, but, they, you know, it's all official now. So at the very bottom, you can see the Maffin stack. Um, so it's Firebase for user authentication and a couple other features like dynamic links. MongoDB for document storage, AWS for object storage. The reason we have two different databases is because I kind of found that easier to deal with and rather because MongoDB doesn't really store objects very well. So we have two different databases. Um, Node.js as a server and Flutter for the a actual uh, front end, so the app. And um, again, uh, they recently, you can see this meme on the right, they recently launched Flutter 2.0. You know, as I'm developing this application, you know, Google's really pushing a lot of uh, development for their platform as well, so for Flutter. And, uh, you know, they're adding a cool ton of features, you know. So now Flutter Web, I think it's out of beta now. So hopefully um, our goal is to transition the same code base to be also run on the web which would really speed up development uh, process. Cool. Um, so organization. So even though I'm the only developer and Arcos, I recently onboarded two new developers as well as uh, we have um, one uh, individual working on the kind of management side of things. So I added a, a GitHub started, start get, getting started page on the GitHub, on the GitHub Wiki. We started using a scrum board which uh, you can see in the bottom right. So this is all um, during the course of the semester. Uh, we used, it's called ClickUp. Um, 
we just kind of decided this one. I'm not sure if there was a particular reason. Um, and then, yeah, using this, this scrum board, you know, it does a lot of things, but we are able to outline how the project structure is going to go, how the development process is going to go. Um, and on GitHub, every dev, every new dev gets their own branch and then they PR to master. So it's a little bit of a standard. And on top of that, we also created a Slack channel for communication. So a lot of, um, different platforms being used for development. And I'm sure there's going to be even more as we, uh, trudge along. Oh, I also missed one discord discord for, um, screen sharing. But yeah, so that's kind of how we're organized currently. Um, progress. I mean, during this semester was probably my most development heavy, uh, semester. I've only been working on this project for maybe one or two months outside of our coast, you know, maybe November, December. So, you know, most, if not, I'd say like 80% of development process progress has been, uh, had gone through during this semester. So a ton of commits, a ton of PRs, um, 40 tasks and new features, which is honestly, I, when I looked at that number, I was kind of surprised because, you know, you're just working on one feature at a time and, you know, to get 40 done over the course of you know, however many weeks we've been developing, that's a, that's, that's a pretty good number to look at because, you know, most of these were my tasks that I completed. Um, like I said, I have two new devs onboarded, um, one potentially coming in uh, in the future. And a lot of the, the really critical functionality, you know, connection to the databases, um, parsing data, uh, a lot of the, the critical features that I outlined for uh, to be completed for the semester were are more or less complete, which is really nice, um, as well as some major business end tasks. Um, another thing that is really cool was the content and the graphics that we had. You can see there's a ton of ton of stuff here. Most of this paid. I'm not a very good graphic designer, so I had to pay other people to do this. Um, uh, in this top center, you can see with like the halo kind of looking one. I think that's going to be our app icon. And then we paid for a big new UI over amp uh, over. There's a whole new UI. So you can see that this is actually a, a screenshot directly from my phone. So, the you know, it's running on my phone already. Um, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I think it looks pretty good. And, uh, again, a lot of these logos, these are just iterations of the logos. And, uh, this is just an example. I didn't really want to like paste in 20 screenshots of my phone, but this is like the signing page. And it's a very similar kind of aesthetic throughout the app. Um, one issue, one very major issue is that I unfortunately contracted L C word, uh, so yeah, this fortunate. So uh, this is actually more unfortunate than you would think, right? Usually when you're working on a project, you know, two week, uh, getting pushed back two weeks is okay. Well, it is what it is, but I, I was really kind of, um, on a, I had really planned out my development schedule, uh, and my release schedule. And, and all of this was kind of dependent on time. And now that I, I was basically at commission for nearly, uh, nearly two weeks, really. Um, I had to really push back all management and development plans. Uh, pretty far back, but you know, two weeks is, is pretty, pretty substantial piece of time also. So yeah, get some fun memes here. Um, looking into the future. So we're going to be launching an alpha on May 3rd, uh, which, you know, very soon it's uh, less than two weeks now. Actually, I think it's, it's exactly not yes, yeah, it's, it's 13 days from now. Um, so we're still on track. So the alpha is just really going to be testing kind of functionality, making sure, you know, the app doesn't break. Um, after that, there's gonna be a six week period of improvement, uh, making, you know, fixing all the things that do break because things do break. Um, and then six weeks from then we'll be launching a beta and then X amount of weeks from then we'll be launching the official platform. And uh, you can see this fourth bullet we're talking about the web launch. So hopefully within four weeks, which is a month, uh, within, within about four weeks of the alpha launch, which is May 3rd. So really basically uh, late May, early June, we're hoping to launch the web version of this platform so you can upload and view and everything directly from the, the web, which would be pretty cool. But that's all kind of dependent on how well the Flutter web platform holds up. So this is a little bit more uh, in the air, but the app is definitely uh, on, on track. Uh, one other thing to, uh, in the future is to add in some better documentation. As I was pretty much just working strictly on the development, uh, on adding new features, uh, the development is pretty bad. Uh, not the, the, the documentation. The documentation is pretty bad, uh, i.e. very little to none. So 
uh, as new devs will come in and uh, we definitely want to have some better documentation. So this is in the future. Thanks for tuning in. All right, thank Any you. Questions? Cool. Um, so, so again, let's uh, let's uh, continue with. Uh, why don't you give up the the presentation, and uh, we'll see if we have any any questions. Um, so, th do we have anybody out there? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So let's see. We have uh, Yaks, I think, is next, and then RPI TV Glimpse. Now we're running short on time, uh, so Yaks, why don't you guys get up there? Um, I'm gonna go. We, uh, I'm gonna present for for Eric uh, as the last presentation. Um, you know, I'd appreciate it if, if, if you guys can stick around, but I understand that when we get to 635, uh, you guys can, you know, have the option of turning into a pumpkin. So, uh, you know, if, if you're going, you know, if you can stick around just a little bit, that would be great. Um, but let's try to get through the, the next two presentations and stay on schedule, which we don't normally do. Um, I like the fact, again, that, uh, that you kind of pivoted while you were working to, uh, to, to, bring in new contributors. That's not, you know, that, that shows a little bit of, uh, of flexibility and attention to community building. Um, what, what was your, what was your thought process? Is this a question for me? I'm yeah. Sure. You're the pivot. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, to, to bring in new developers, I wanted more help on, you know, to bring in a more community, you know, cause we'll be onboarding more developers as potentially funding comes in. So I'd like to get, developers already in so we kind of have the process of onboarding developers mm -hmm. so it doesn't take weeks for for stuff to get started um you know on top of that getting um you know features added in you know very tight deadlines i mean again um we had only set that we're going to launch an alpha within like one month so uh you know I, I would i would be able to work on it a lot but then having more developers would, would definitely help with that so um yeah i, I wasn't uh, i was pretty happy um uh, how the community and how the team is, is evolving. Good. All right, uh, Yax, you guys ready? Hello, is my mic going through? It's coming through fine. Whoopee, okay. So, good afternoon, guys. Uh, we are Yax, and we will be glad to present you the progress we made on to the website. There are some features that we're extremely happy to announce. And, uh, okay. Um, as shown, these are the people who make up the team. Uh, it's one or two people fewer compared to last semester, but overall, it's still one of the biggest team in Arcos. So, uh, yes, what is it again? Are we yet another course schedule there? Well, that's our name. Uh, we will assist you in finding courses and construct your semester. You guys could try out our, uh, you could try that out on our site. Uh, before, we only had a dark mode to sell. But let's see what we added to Yax during this semester. So, what's new? Well, our plan for this semester was to obviously squash all the bugs we had before. And we fixed practically all of them. In addition, uh, for all the bugs, finally, we died. Uh, we now have a con job with GitHub Actions that updates the data to Yax every hour. Now the site can stay up to date. We also... Uh, have a mobile app with our, uh, yeah, we have our own app now with our PWA. Feel free to download it and try it out. Uh, we also have a credit card feature that's in the works. It will be explained later by Jason and Frank who were working on this. Finally, we are speed for once. Gone were the days where you watch the grass grow while waiting for Yaks to load. We are finally uh, getting faster and it will only get faster from here. There seems to be an infiltration from SIS. Uh, I guess, I don't know where he is at the moment. So what's new for YAX? Uh, we will continue to listen to students' features and requests and bugs. Uh, it's thanks to them for spotting opportunities to get better. We are currently in the working uh, with a feature that was once presented with the old YAX, but not in the new one, where it could show all, possibility, all possible semester outcomes with the students' selected courses. We are also looking at other features that we cannot discuss here since there are some competitors here and hopefully it will make YAX unique from the rest. We will continue to improve our accessibility since, uh, let's be honest, should, be, should have been worked on uh, way before. Uh, 
Lastly, but more importantly, we are still on our path to maturity. We, have, we need one or two more productive semester and then reach out to other schools and universities. YAX is not only aiming to empower students at RPI, but in other places as well. So as a standard procedure, uh, the team follows this workflow as shown. Uh, the issues come in, some take priority than others. The team are free to claim issues uh, they want to work on and so on. Uh, once approved and merged to master, there would be a GitHub workflow that uh, would update our main server in RPS network via a CD pipeline. We also meet up once a week, every Friday, after the Arcos meet to discuss on everyone's progress. Uh, if anyone has any issues, blockers, ideas, and et cetera. Now we are going to hear from each of member of the YAX team on what they have implemented. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nicole. So for this semester, I worked on moving the sign up button and kind of merging that in with the login button. Uh, if you can kind of see it on the right, uh, we used to have, it would say login then sign up. Uh, now that's just kind of all in one thing. Um, I also linked the course names on the scheduler. So when you add them to your schedule, if you want to learn more about the class, you can just click on the name uh, on the schedule and it'll bring you to our YAKS kind of course explore page where you can learn more about the class. Um, and then finally, uh, there were just some, I guess, aesthetic issues on our main loading page, um, just kind of issues with our text hierarchy and styling. So I kind of uniformed them and just made it more cohesive and uh, pleasing to the eye. Um, so uh, this semester, I've been working on the credit cap feature, with it, which is basically reading the number of uh, total number of credits and then um, display a warning message when the selected courses uh, exceed the user customized credit cap. Um, specifically, I've worked on uh, setting the customized credit cap number and warning message from the admin page and then store these information into the uh, database. That's it. Uh, hi guys, uh, I've been working on two features. Uh, the first one implements the ability of following the system's name. Uh, we changed to the uh, we changed we changed the order of page loading, which will reduce the flicker. Uh, the page load uh, the page will load color schemes before loading the course. Uh, also, it can detect the system's color settings or the browser's color settings to enable light or dark mode automatically. And the theme can be changed without refreshing. It will be only changed uh, auto, uh, auto changing the new, th new theme setting. You can double click the more icon to enter. Another feature is the responsive schedule height. Uh, before the schedule's height is fixed to 600 pixels. Since we need to calculate uh, absolute positions and heights for each each course, now it's fully in relative scale. The height is now based on the height of the viewports or the VH unit. Uh, it is not merged into master since uh, there's performance issue. Uh, we, we use CSS map functions to calculate the height so if you would put too much too many courses into the schedule and constantly changing the height of the viewports, it may produce some some laggy. Yeah, that that's all my work. All right, so um, I'm Josh Marion. This is my first semester at Arcos, so um, I, I did spend some time getting to learn like GitHub, VS Code, and uh, Docker Desktop. But then um, after that, I, wor I worked on um, op optimizing our like the actual course schedule that you see when you look at the um, like when you add courses, you, you see them all um, pop up. Um, so basically, I just kind of optimized our current colors and then we, we added a lot more. And then now we have 
a much better um, range of colors um, than, we, than we used to. So, yeah, and then I'll pass it on to Nick. Uh, yeah, I'm Nick. So with those new colors comes the challenge of being colorblind accessible, which is why Yax now has a new colorblind friendly color palette for the core scheduler that can be turned on and off using the toggle right above the export data button. Uh, you can see what that palette looks like in the top corner. And this palette works with the three main types of color blindness, uh, red, blue, and green blind. And you can see examples of what that, what the palette looks like at the bottom. And for those curious, the uh, pictures were simulated using that site. So the first issue I worked on this semester um, related to visibility issues in dark mode. So I fixed section boxes and implemented the hover mechanism, which previously only worked in light mode. And then the next issue I focused on was an issue with image exporting. And there was an issue regarding sub semesters like arch semesters and previously no image downloaded. Whereas now the image will download based on what term the user has selected from the drop down menu. So this semester I have finished uh, implemented the functionality of getting the credit cap set up by the admin from the admin panel. So that when a user try to add a new course, uh, they will use the credit cap to determine whether the student has uh, enrolled in too much too many courses. And also I've implemented the functionality to distinguish user to get different type of credit cap because grad student and undergrad student, they have different credit limits. And it will, uh, uh, the YAX will display different warning message based on what the admin set up and based on the user type. I worked in some broad features, uh, essentially could gathering together and aggregating the logs for production support. And if we hit an issue, we can get a link to a specific thing and search for specific issues. Uh, and then because I was uh, PM last semester, I was essentially just trying to spring over to the current boss man, Rich. Uh, all right, next. Yep, and then finally for me, I I had to um, uh, migrate the server to a new server box, which my uh, majority contributed to the decreased loading times. Uh, another implementation that contributed to the loading times is the concept of microcaching, where there's a middle ground of loading the data at a relative fast speed, which is caching, and getting the updated data. I also implemented the uh, PWA and generated all the PNG files assets that would support both Apple and Android. Feel free to try our app again. And more importantly, tell us any bugs or improvements we need to do or fix. So that would be it. Any questions? Nicely done. Um, I have to admit that the question that first came to mind was about the uh, colorblind palette. Um, and then you guys followed up with, with that immediately. So uh, I have to say good job for heading that one off. Uh, I am interested. Is that 518 compliant, your, your colorblind palette? Or... Um, Yeah, have you looked at at five? I'm sorry, is it five hundred eight or five eighteen? I get confused. But uh, there are ADA uh, guidelines. Have you guys checked into that at all, or or are you just doing this? Uh, uh, to be honest, I have not. Cool. Well, you're on the right. You're on the right path. Um, it's really important to, to what you're doing. Um, I'd love to see you guys take a look at. I think it's five hundred eight compliance. Um, but if if you look at uh, at ADA compliance guidelines for uh, web development, because uh, you're you're already hitting. I mean, that's the type of things that they want you to look at. So that that's a really cool, especially if you're going to branch out to other universities. That would be a really good thing to spend a little little uh, time on. Uh, Frank just pat just uh, popped one into the uh, into the uh, uh, chat. So you know, again, good good job. I think you did a you know you did good. Let's uh, let's uh, keep it up. Yeah, on the accessibility thing, I think we used a Firefox debugger with the accessibility, mm -hmm. uh, and I think they encoded in the 508. So I'm pretty sure we're we don't we don't explicitly know it, but I think we, I think we looked at it. Excellent. I mean that that's that's uh, 
yeah, that makes sense. Cool. All right. Um, why don't you guys see if I can find me on this list now? Why don't you guys uh, ask uh, ask them questions while you're uh, while you're going along, and I will pop up my screen. I think if I can figure out how again, um, so that I can do. Our last presentation for today. Let's see. And of course, I'm the one that's not. Why is this taking so long? Everything is backing up on me right now. Hmm. There we go. All right. And uh, this reconfiguring is a pain in the neck. All right, so here is uh, is RPI TV, and I hope I'm not going to butcher this too badly because I didn't have enough time to really look at it uh, in, in too much detail. Um, but this is a project by Eric Roberts. He's working on this by himself. Um, and actually, I think I'm going to leave this in non-presentation mode because he did give me some, some notes to read along. Um, you can get this. It's, it's up. It's working at RPI. You can get it. You know, you can, you, uh, they have a website, uh, unfortunately, um, come on, if I'm understanding, um, it's, it's a, it's a TV, RPI TV is an RPI club. Um, they film campus events. You may have seen them around at different events. I certainly have. Um, you can ask them to come up and, um, film one of your events. We had them in previous semesters come and film some of our guest speakers, for example, but they'll do, you know, things that aren't open source as well, which is, you know, unfortunate, but, but, you know, that's, that's a, a fine thing to do. Um, she to see rinse the lyrics, players, et cetera, is, are the things that, that Eric points out. This was founded in 2003. So the club itself is 18 years old. It's been around for quite some time. Um, so what Eric decided to do as, as a member of RPI TV um, well, the web, RPI website is 10 years old. It's been around for a long time. It doesn't meet the current standards. You know, if you think back 10 years, you know, we were using Abakai and, uh, and, and Stone tablets. Um, this whole 
uh, keyboard thing is, is completely new, a uh, little bit of hyperbole. Um, but the idea is that a lot of things come in and out of both fashion and, uh, and uh, currency in 10 years. So um, Eric is working on uh, adding some, some freshness to this. He's trying to make it mobile friendly so that you can you know, actually use RPI TV on your, on your uh, phones or other mobile devices. You may or may not have known that, uh, that Flash is dead. Uh, it's been retired. It's been removed. Um, so there's no way right now to, uh, to, to uh, videos weren't, or, or in the old RPI TV. There was no way for videos to be played. So, you know, he's trying to work around that as well. Um, and, and finally, you know, there's accessibility. Um, it doesn't comply with the Rensselaer accessibility standards. That's 508 compliance, which we were just talking about. Um, and, and of course, as in any old software, any new software, any software, there are a lot of bugs. And, uh, and so there was plenty of work for Eric to concentrate on over this semester. He looked at two different, come on. you know, as with all of you, there's a front end part and a back end part. Um, so on the back end, he's using GraphQL to experiment with new technology. That's one of the great things about Arcos is you can throw in something like experiment with new technology. Uh, and we give you credit for it, whereas a lot of times you're actually expected or you're told what to what to do. Eric was able to experiment with GraphQL on a large scale production environment, uh, which which kind of gives him a leg up and allows him to explore some things that he's interested in. And then on the front end, he decided to go with Nuxt.js as it gives the best of server side web page rendering uh, and client side rendering. You know, so Google works well as does your ability to view things. Oops. And I keep clicking on my my WebEx screen instead of on uh, the actual um, slides. So Eric started working on this last summer. I think this is his second semester working on it for, for Arcos. Um, he's been doing a great job. Um, there are a lot of resources uh, on the web RPI TV website. And... Uh, you know, as you know, I call it the engineering disease. He doesn't, so if it's a bad reference, you can uh, you can strike it. Um, but engineers like to see everything, and they like to be able to look at everything and tweak all the knobs. Um, Eric is putting in some some pagination systems that allow them to uh, look at things in you know allow you to see the forest for the trees. I believe you know, so you can go through and 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 look at the components you want without having to look at everything all at the same time. Um, so it, it's an, impro an improvement to the administrator um, implementation. Uh, infinitely scrolling lists, so you can go back and back and back and back. I expect it's not completely infinite. You would probably run out of things uh, that RPI TV has done, but since they've been around since 2003, it may take you... Uh, quite a bit of time. Um, he's improved the search the uh, search capabilities. Um, you know, again, this is an engineering disease thing where you want to be able to tweak everything and search on every possible uh, variable or, or field. Um, but it's always good to have a simple one that you use 90% of the time because 90% of the time that's all you're going to want to use. So having the ability to do it to do a simple search and then swap over to an advanced search. Uh, when needed, is a very important and very uh, powerful uh, capability to add. And then um, he's also designed and created a bunch of other uh, general components, multi-purpose, used in multiple locations throughout the website, so kind of on the, the order of, uh, of uh, you know, reuse, recycle kind of things. So... Um, you know, so he's been a very busy person working on, on uh, all of this all of this stuff. Not all of it's been completely implemented, um, but he's kind of laid the groundwork for all of it to be implemented and to quickly move forward uh, on the rest. The productions page, so this is what the old front page looked like at the top. There's a new cleaner design with some uh, really cool graphics, much neater, much easier to kind of grasp, uh, less cluttered. Uh, and then the productions page 
uh, has been rewritten, mostly complete. Um, he's adding additional uh, filters in the future so you can kind of select what you want as you go through by selecting the filters you want to apply to the images. Um, and then he's, these are the paginated lists that he was working on to make uh, administration of the site uh, much easier to do. Okay, so future. So I like when you guys say we're going to be done with something by uh, some date in the future. Uh, the only way you're done with something is when you kind of get tired of working on it because it's almost always the case that there's more and more to do than you ever thought about. So, for example, uh, you know, if if, uh, if Yaks had decided that all they wanted to do was serve up uh, schedules, they would have been done years ago. But now they're working on all sorts of other stuff and they're trying to bring it to other um, other uh, uh, universities and quacks came along because there was still so much that they felt yaks could do. They came up and, and invented their own uh, site to, to kind of take care of the things that they prioritized. So there's always stuff to do. Among the things that Eric would like to do is complete the contact form. So right now you have to email them to, uh, to get them to come to your production. Um, but it would be nice, you know, to, to just write on the, on the site itself have a contact form so you could make the request right off their site. And, and that's, that's a much cleaner uh, implementation. Um, there's a lot of lists that need to be implemented or paginated. Uh, he currently has it only implemented for the people, um, but he sees the need for it and he now has a component he can use. Um, and they have to be, all of these components that he's developed have to be brought in and placed on, on all the pages where they're needed. Um, More improvements to the search function, use of pop-up texts, pop-up menus instead of having to type things in. Um, and his hope is to have this deployed in a beta state before the end of the year. Um, and then again, uh, you know, which is which is a good target. I'd like to see him do it even earlier because, you know, um, beta is always good um, once you have a workable one. Uh, and then finally... There are over 2,000 videos dating back to 2003, and since Flash Player is gone, all of these need to be re-encoded. So by the way, if you're looking for um, something to work on, there looks, it looks like there, is plenty, there are plenty of things for you to work on on RPI TV. Um, RPI TV itself is looking for new members this fall, no prior experience needed. And Eric is happy to, uh, to, to answer your emails if you're interested. Um, that said, it's been a one-person project so far. So he, doesn't really, he hasn't really spent a lot of time working on things like contribution guidelines uh, and code documentation. Um, I'm sorry, he, he, has, he hasn't done things like uh, contribution doc guidelines, uh, but he has been working on code documentation and... Uh, and uh, putting together a wiki with, with website documentation as well. So um, it's good. He's, good. He's, plan he's hoping to make it available on the public GitHub wiki as well. And uh, I think that is mainly what, hopefully I didn't butcher this too much for you, uh, for you Eric, um, but that was uh, RPI TV. Um, Cool. One thing I will say, I had some requests to uh, to open up um, to, to redisplay the uh, the uh, uh, venue code. So I think I'm going to do that now while you guys are asking any questions. And for those of you who are worried that venue is closed, I have the power. So I will reopen it up for you. I believe I have the power. We'll see if I have the power. Okay, let's see if this works now. All right, so are there any questions that I can try to answer or that we can field out to, uh, to chat? 
if anybody if anybody needs it that should be our qr code i think i'm am i showing that now yes i'll show it better i should see two of them um thanks for everything um i, I really do appreciate you guys sticking around a little bit i know we ran a little bit over uh, not as much over as i was afraid we were going to be but more over than i had hoped uh, we are refining um Anyway, thank you, and thank, thanks to all our presenters, um, and uh, we will see you on Friday. Thank you, Susan. I'm free, but just for, uh, just for, uh, by the way, Hunter, I'm, I'm free, but just for uh, special, special occasions. So um, certainly if anybody has a, has a, uh, has a pressing concern with, uh, with time zones, for example, um, that's, you know, you can either tape it or, or give it to me. Hunter, I'm going to have to apologize to you as well. Um, I didn't get the poll buddy uh, presentation recorded. And it's unfortunate because it was a very good presentation, um, but I'm not going to make you redo it. Um, but but I, I, I do want to uh, apologize for for missing that one.